Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Forward Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. Hello everybody, welcome to Forward Gettysburg. My name is Aaron Smith, and in today's episode, I'm going to be giving you a tour. We are going to be talking about the first day of action here at Gettysburg. It is again, super, super cold out, maybe about 17 degrees right now, but I love getting out here and I'm gonna get out here as much as I can. Like I said, if it's zero degrees, if it's a hundred degrees, you will find me on the battlefield on a weekend. So a part of why I wanted to do this video to give you guys a tour of the first day. I've mentioned in some of my other videos that I am aspiring to be a licensed battlefield guide. So part of the reason I've been making videos, why I made this channel is not only to practice for myself, but also get into the research and share that research and get a lot of practice so that I will be ready to take that test and ace it and hopefully see you guys out here on the battlefield. So without further ado, let's get into it. Gettysburg day one. And the story of Gettysburg doesn't start here in Pennsylvania, but rather starts in Vicksburg, Mississippi. In June, the Union forces under Ulysses S. Grant, they were closing in upon the Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River, Vicksburg. So Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, they will meet and they will devise a plan in order to relieve the pressure on that city. Lee will invade the North. Not only that, but if Lee invades the North and is able to win a stunning victory on Northern soil, he will very, very likely force the politicians of the North to the bargaining table in order to secure Confederate independence. Now at this time, you have to remember Robert E. Lee was nearly undefeated. Sure, he had uh, some losses at Malvern Hill and you can count Antietam as a draw. But up to this point in the war, Robert E. Lee was a god among men on the battlefield. Not only that, but his men looked up to him and his men had such high morale that they thought themselves invincible. So it's Robert E. Lee's hubris that led him here to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. June 30th, 18. 63. Buford's cavalry is posted in and around Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Buford made this building behind me his headquarters, the Lutheran Seminary building here on Seminary Ridge. Buford has placed his two brigades underneath of him, Devon and Gamble, to the north, to the west, and to the northeast to look out for Confederates. They heard that Confederates were operating in the area. So on June 30th, his scouts to the west are going to spot Johnson Pettigrew's brigade marching toward Gettysburg. And Pettigrew is going to spot the Federal cavalry. They're going to eye them out. Perhaps there was some skirmishing. And then he's going to fall back towards Cash Town and report to Henry Heath, who is going to send it up to AP Hill. They decide that next day, July 1st, to march towards Gettysburg in what is described as a reconnaissance in force. They wanted to procure supplies. And here's where we get into the great shoe myth of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg, of course. The rumor goes, was fought over shoes. Perhaps it was fought over supplies. That's the reason or one of the reasons why the Confederates were up north here. They were trying to procure supplies for their invasion of Pennsylvania and the, and the broader war effort. However, the Battle of Gettysburg in a larger sense was fought because of the road network. Both armies happened to be operating in this area of Northern Maryland and South Central Pennsylvania. And if you run through this area, if you drive through this area in your car, it is nearly impossible to go anywhere without going near or through Gettysburg. So it is the concentration of the armies in this area and the fact that the roads of Gettysburg radiate out like spokes on a wagon wheel that's the reason why they ended up fighting here at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So Buford's defense of Gettysburg is going to begin about three miles to the west of here. 
that's where Gamble's Brigade is going to be posted. And again, they're posted in a line that goes all the way from the west to the northwest to the north and then to the northeast. And what they're going to do is they're going to fire at these Confederates. As the Confederates, which are going to be Heath's division, make their way down the roads, they're going to march in column. They're going to have skirmishers forward. The skirmishers are going to fire with the Federal cavalry. As the, ca as the rebels make their way, they're going to start to deploy into line. These are all things that take a considerable amount of time. And while this is happening, Buford, headquartered at the seminary, is going to send off for John Reynolds First Corps, the nearest corps of the Army of the Potomac to this position. So he is stalling. He is performing a delaying action in order to allow the infantry to move forward here to Gettysburg. Oh, those are geese. I thought it was someone who was yelling at me. But he's going to stall the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. So as these men move from column into line, this is going to take time. And then as they see them move into line, knowing that they're soon to be overwhelmed, they're going to fall back. And there's a series of ridges that run out to the west. So about three miles from here is Knoxland Ridge. And that's where they're going to start to begin this delaying action. So we have the Confederates moving from column to line, and now the cavalry is falling back. And these cavalry men are dismounted. They have breech loading Spencer carbines. Now, the interesting thing, a lot of people think that they had repeaters at Gettysburg. That's not true. You could still fire at a faster pace than the traditional muzzle-loading rifle or muzzle-loading musket that the Confederates had. Car just drove by. They're probably like, that guy's crazy, man. It's 18 degrees outside. What are you doing? But anyway, <laughs> But they can fire at a faster pace than the oncoming Confederates. So, Confederates deploy column to line, cavalry moves back. Now they move back to Ur's Ridge, which you might be able to make out just over behind me. That small rise there, that's Ur's Ridge. The same process is going to repeat again. These Confederates are going to move back from their line into column, march down the road, send out their skirmishers. Skirmishers are gonna engage the cavalrymen, kind of hold them in place. And then as the column approaches, they're gonna to shift to line. Well, process repeats itself over and over again. Finally, the cavalry, they are going to make their defiant stand here on McPherson's Ridge, which is where I stand right now. At this point, there's about 2,000 cavalrymen under Gamble going up against about 2,500 Confederates. And those Confederate brigades are going to be the brigades of Davis and Archer. Davis has Mississippians and North Carolinians under his command. Archer has Tennesseans and Alabamians under his command. So these are some of the rare examples of mixed Confederate brigades here. Most Confederate brigades would be organized by state, whereas the Union, almost all of their brigades were mixed. I can think of very, very few examples. I can think of Colonel Roy Stone's Pennsylvania Bucktails, you know, the Pennsylvania Reserves that weren't mixed brigades or mixed divisions, but most of the time the Union are going to have brigades uh, that are made up from men, made up of men from different states. So seeing that the federal cavalrymen under Buford are kind of making their final defiant stand here, Heath is going to start to deploy artillery along Hers Ridge. And he's going to start pounding them. Meanwhile, there's only one battery that the, that the Union has. That's going to be John Califf's battery. And Califf is going to separate his battery into sections. A section is usually about two guns. It's going to separate them into sections. Not only to kind of split them out so that if a barrage happens, the entire battery isn't wiped out. But he wants to give the appearance... Again, he's trying to slow down the Confederates. He wants to give the appearance of a larger force here than what is actually here. They are trying to buy time for Reynolds and the 1st Corps to arrive. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, Reynolds and the 1st Corps will arrive here at Gettysburg and take the field to fight off the Confederate attackers. 
So I'm standing on the north side of the Chambersburg Pike. And as the Confederates advance, like I said, it's going to be two brigades of Confederates. I'll apologize ahead of time due to the sound of the traffic. This is a relatively busy road. So the two brigades is going to be Davis's brigade advancing toward the north of the pike. And then we're going to have Archer's brigade. They're going to be advancing to the south of the pike. Now, the first Union units to arrive on the field is going to be Lysander Cutler's brigade of the first corps. Lysander Cutler is going to split his brigade into two. He's going to send three regiments to the north of the pike in this area. He's going to send two regiments to the south of the pike in the area of the McPherson farm. The 76th New York and the 56th Pennsylvania, they're going to take positions this way. Meanwhile, we have Hall's second main battery, a battery consisting of three inch ordnance rifles that are going to take position in this area of the pike, just north of the pike. However, we have another regiment of Cutler's Brigade, the 147th New York, and they're trying to get here with these other two regiments. They're the three regiments that are taking position to the north of the pike here. However, Hall's battery is going to cut them off. As these Union regiments are taking position here, we have Davis's brigade, namely the 55th North Carolina regiment. They are going to be making for the flank of these two regiments here. And eventually they're going to hit them in that flank and send them back to the Sheeds Woods. The 147th New York, eventually, once they're through that traffic jam, they're going to take positions here and they're going to refuse their right flank to stop the oncoming Confederates. However, it's not going to be enough. They too are going to be shattered and sent back to the Sheeds Woods. And before I get further into this story, I want you guys to realize I'm going to be covering a lot of different areas and many, many times it's going to be the actions taking place here are going to be happening simultaneously. Obviously, we can't be in more than two places at once or more than one place at once. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind that oftentimes while one thing is happening on the battlefield, another thing is happening in the on the battlefield. Civil War battles don't happen in vacuums. So just remember that as we go through our little tour here. So we're back on the south end of the Chambersburg Pike here. And this is where the next Union Brigade to reach the field will see the very first action of their time here at Gettysburg. We are talking about the Iron Brigade, probably the fiercest and most well-known fighters in the Army of the Potomac. And the second Wisconsin is going to lead them and they're gonna make their way over that Eastern arm of McPherson's Ridge. And they're going to meet Archer's Tennesseans in these woods behind me, the Herbst Woods. And they're not even going to have time to fire. They're not even going to have time to load their muskets. They're going to attach their bayonets and charge forward, driving those men out of the woods. And a very, very intense fight will ensue. Meanwhile, Reynolds has sent off a courier to Oliver Otis Howard, Major General of the 11th Corps. And as he does that, Reynolds is going to come here and personally overview the placement of troops in this area and as he's doing so he will be shot right at the base of the skull on the back of his neck and he will die instantly reeling from the saddle he will be the highest ranking union officer to fall here at gettysburg the men of the iron brigade they will continue to drive archers tennesseans and alabamians out of these woods drive them across willoughby creek which is a creek just over this end at the very very bottom the base of mcpherson's ridge they will drive them across the creek and they will eventually capture many many men of archers brigade including General Archer himself, they're going to send Archer back to the Union lines and he is going to meet his old friend Abner Doubleday, now commanding the 1st Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Abner Doubleday very slyly will say, good morning, Archer. It's very good to see you. How are you? And, and Archer, very, very upset and deep in his feelings about being captured, will look at Doubleday and say, it's not good to see you by a damn sight. Now, only four regiments of the Iron Brigade are going to be engaged here at Erbst Woods. The one remaining regiment, the 6th Wisconsin, they're going to be left in reserve on Seminary Ridge. As the events are an un 
unfolding north of the pike, those three regiments being pushed back to the Sheeds Woods by Davis's brigade of Mississippians and North Carolinians. The Mississippians and the North Carolinians, they're going to make their way toward Hall's Battery. Hall's Battery's right is now unprotected. And remember, Hall's battery was, was right where we were there on the Chambersburg Pike. His right flank is totally undefended. Colonel Rufus Dahls of the 6th Wisconsin will receive an order to support Hall's battery. And they will move across the fields from Seminary Ridge at the double quick. Behind me stands the famous railroad cut. And at the time of the battle, none of these tracks were here. This was literally just a cut through the ground. The 6th Wisconsin, they're making their way toward this position. They see Davis's brigade coming this way. And now we have the 84th New York and the 95th New York. They're going to turn and they remember they were at the McPherson barn, the McPherson farm area. They're going to turn and make their way this way and they're going to fire upon those rebels. Well, the rebels, they don't want to take fire. So they see this railroad cut. They're going to take cover and soon they're going to start firing at the oncoming Wisconsinites and the oncoming New Yorkers. And they're going to think, hey, this is pretty sweet. This is a ready made rifle trench. We can take cover, fire at the guys, no problem. But still, the Wisconsinites under Dawes, the Iron Brigade, that, that awesome regiment in the Iron Brigade, and those New Yorkers, that 84th New York, also known as the 14th Brooklyn Militia, and the 95th New York, they're going to continue firing upon these rebels. They're going to continue moving forward, and eventually they're going to come upon this railroad cut. Rufus Dawes is going to send about 20 men, and he's going to cut off that east exit there to this railroad cut, cutting off a route of retreat. And now this railroad cut, what the rebels of Davis's brigade once thought was a ready-made rifle trench has become a trap. It has become a coffin for them. And realizing that the gig is up, they are going to surrender to Dawes. The 55th North Carolina, they're going to exit. The 42nd Mississippi, they're going to be able to escape. But the 2nd Mississippi, the majority of them are going to become captives of Dawes and his Wisconsinites. And they're going to send them back beyond enemy lines. Also behind me, you have a good view of the Sheeds Woods, that area where the rest of Cutler's Brigade has retreated and reformed to. And at this point in the battle, we're talking 11 o'clock, 1130 in the morning, somewhere approaching midday. There's going to be a lull in the fighting. As this lull occurs, both sides are going to continue concentrating their forces here at Gettysburg. Around this time, the rest of the 1st Corps of the Army of the Potomac is going to arrive on the field. And they are now going to have a line that extends there from the Erbst Woods, there along the east arm and the west arm of McPherson's Ridge. It's going to extend from there up across the Chambersburg Pike into the Sheeds Woods along Oak Ridge. However, the Confederates, they are receiving reinforcements themselves. Not only do they have two regiments remaining in Henry Heath's division, Pettigrew's Brigade and Brockenbrow's Brigade, only Archer and Davis really saw action that morning. Not only that, but... Dorsey Pender's division is going to move up. Rhodes' division of Yule's Corps is also going to be making its way to the field. And Early's division is not too far behind them. So the Confederates, they are massing more troops here than the Union are able to. Howard's Corps is on its way up. In the meantime, Dan Sickles, who we're going to get to when we get to the video on day two, uh, probably in quite some depth because I love Dan Sickles. But Dan Sickles, he's at Emmitsburg, which is not that far away, but he is conflicted on orders. He has received the Pipe Creek Circular, a plan that Meade has devised, a defensive plan, a fallback plan. But nonetheless, Sickles has this conflicting order of hearing reports of battle at Gettysburg, but still having this Pipe Creek Circular to worry about. So Dan Sickles is kind of like, frozen in action here during this time. 
So I'm now currently on Oak Hill and Oak Hill has probably the best view of the day one battlefield in the area. We can clearly make out the Union line. Now remember, like I said earlier, we have the first core. Their line is running along Oak Ridge directly this way. They are, they have some troops running down the Mummusburg Road, kind of refusing their flank there. And then they're going to run all the way across to Chambersburg Pike up to the McPherson barn there, which you might be able to make out in the distance and then running through the Herbst Woods along McPherson's Ridge. Now behind the camera on Oak Hill, Rhodes' division is beginning to form and the action is going to pick up somewhere in the early afternoon. And Rhodes is going to send two of his brigades, O'Neill and Iverson, to attack that position on Oak Ridge. O'Neill is going to attack kind of that point where they refuse the line. The Union First Corps is going to be able to repulse that attack. Iverson is going to make his way through the fields here and attack kind of head on there on that Oak Ridge position. And Iverson is going to be absolutely devastated in this attack. His men aren't going to see what's coming at them. They're going to be fired upon, charged upon. Several of them are going to be captured. Iverson, he is going to be disgraced seeing his men waving white handkerchiefs in surrender. It's said that Iverson's men were lined up in a perfectly straight line. They had no idea what was coming. We then have Junius Daniel's brigade making their way even further to the west and they're going to start attacking that McPherson's barn area and Roy Stone's Pennsylvania Brigade, the Pennsylvania Bucktails are going to be posted in that area and they're going to repulse three attacks by Daniels. Eventually their position is going to fall. While Rhodes is making this attack, Richard Starter Yule commander of the Confederate Second Corps, the replacement for Stonewall Jackson, he is with Rhodes. And part of why Rhodes's attack was so piecemeal, I feel he was pressured by, by Richard Yule to make this attack because Yule could make out the Union 11th Corps taking positions north of town. So currently I'm north of town and this is where the 11th corps is going to take position schimmel Phoenix division is going to take a position to the west of the carlisle road barlow's division is going to take a position over here to the east of the road now schimmel Phoenix wasn't the original commander very much like abner doubleday took over the first corps after reynolds wounding oliver otis howard is going to take over command of all troops on the field here for a momentary time here at Gettysburg. With Oliver Otis Howard taking over command of all the troops of the Army of the Potomac here in the absence of General Meade or anybody else that Meade has instructed, that is going to bump Carl Schurz up to command of the 11th Corps. That then will bump up Schimmelfennig to command of the division. So they're going to take position here. And originally, Barlow's division of the 11th Corps was going to take position at the county almshouse over in this direction. However, Barlow is going to spot a small rise directly behind me known as Blocker's Knoll, named for the Blocker Farm, which is just over in that direction there on the Carlisle Road. It's now known as Barlow's Knoll. Barlow is going to move his division forward. His division consisting of Adelbert Ames, who was former commander of the 20th Maine, and Von Amsberg. So they're going to move their division forward. However, he's going to create a gap in that line. Doles' Georgian Brigade is going to make for that gap. Now we have Kurz Zanowski's Brigade of the 11th Corps moving forward to fill in that gap. Now, so far things are going all right. However, down the Harrisburg Road is coming Early's Division of the 2nd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. And Early is going to strike on the flank. He's going to strike on Barlow's flank. Barlow is going to try to hold that knoll, but his flank is in the air. He has no support to the right of him. And soon, 
his line is going to be shattered and is going to fall back. John B. Gordon's Georgian Brigade, they're going to strike them there at Rock Creek, right at the base of Barlow's Knoll, at the base of Blocker's Knoll, and they're going to shatter them and send them running back through town. Now, the one thing Howard had the forethought to do upon moving the 11th Corps to Gettysburg, he had three divisions. Of course, we have Schimmelfinnig's division, we have Barlow's division, but there's also Adolf von Steinberg's division. He's going to put von Steinberg's division posted on Cemetery Hill. He realizes that Cemetery Hill is the key terrain feature in the Gettysburg area. So he's going to put them at Cemetery Hill. And it's going to be shown that Cemetery Hill will provide a powerful rallying point for the Army of the Potomac. As Barlow's division here is falling back, we have the renewed attack in the Herbst Woods all the way over to the west of us. On the other side of the Union line, Pettigrew's massive brigade of 2,500 men is assaulting the Iron Brigade. We're going to have Biddle's Union Brigade take position to the left of the Iron Brigade, but they are going to be overwhelmed. Then behind them, we have Dorsey Pender's division joining the attack with Heath's division with Pettigrew and Brockenbrow. And soon that area of the line is going to be overwhelmed. There's going to be some delaying actions by some Illinois cavalrymen on the very, very far end of that line there. Lane's Brigade pushing through Lane's Brigade where my ancestor, my fourth great grand uncle Wellington Adams. He was in the 37th North Carolina. I've told you guys about that before in several videos, but he is going to be in Lane's brigade and they're going to be delayed there. However, the push is going to continue and eventually that line there with the Iron Brigade and Biddle's brigade is going to start to falter. So here we have, again, I told you earlier about simultaneous actions happening on the battlefield. We have the right end of the Union line here starting to collapse. We have the left end of the line here starting to collapse. Left flank of the Union Army, the 1st Corps, the Iron Brigade, Biddle's Brigade, all those other brigades, they're going to fall back here to the seminary. I'm on Seminary Ridge right now, and they're going to make a final stand. Meanwhile, to the north of town, the 11th Corps, Barlow and Schimmelfitting, they are trying to get those 11th Corps troops reorganized. They are trying to get them to reform and take defensive positions, but they are not having an easy time. The Confederates are still on coming. Brigadier General Robinson of the 1st Corps, his division there on Oak Ridge, their right flank is now in the air. They have no other troops to their right supporting them. And Rhodes's division, remember, of Ewell's 2nd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, their first attack might not have been successful, but they themselves have regrouped and they are coming again at that Oak Ridge position. And with no one on his right to support him, Robinson is going to order a general withdrawal. However, he is going to leave one regiment, the 16th Maine, to cover that retreat. And that one regiment is going to take on several brigades of Rhodes's division to buy that division time to fall back to Gettysburg. They're going to begin to fall back to Cemetery Hill. They're going to retreat through town. Meanwhile, here on the seminary, Scales and Perrin's brigades and Lane, they are starting to make their way to this position. And Lane and Perrin, they are making their way around that left flank of the Union line here, that last stand, that last ditch effort by the Union to stall the Confederates to, to prevent Gettysburg from falling into enemy hands, but it's not going to be enough. And soon, a general with draw is ordered through the town and now we have two corps of the army of the potomac retreating through the streets of gettysburg through those streets where just earlier that day their arrival was cheered on and lauded by the townspeople and now they are seeing them fall back through the streets there's going to be skirmishing in the streets there's going to be fighting in the streets as these union men withdraw with the confederates in hot pursuit there's going to be cannon fired in the streets of gettysburg but it's not going to be enough the confederate attack advance is still on coming 
the town of Gettysburg to this very day still has signs of this fighting that occurred. You can look at several cannonballs lodged into the brick and, and, and the structures of several of the buildings. You can see signs of skirmishing and fighting in the streets of Gettysburg, bullet holes in the side of buildings and in the bricks in the sides of these buildings. So not only is the battlefield just out on the outskirts of town, but the battlefield is the town itself. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. The Union, they're going to fall back and they're going to regroup with von Steinberg's brigade on Cemetery Hill. The federal forces are eventually going to regroup here on Cemetery Hill. Behind me, you can see the equestrian statues to Oliver Otis Howard and Winfield Scott Hancock. Now, there is a point in the afternoon where Hancock comes on to the field. Now, at the time, he was in command of the Second Corps, but part of Meade's appointment to Commander of the Army of the Potomac, Abraham Lincoln and General-in-Chief Henry Halleck give him the authority to appoint whoever he determines necessary to command despite rank. This is a rather unprecedented move in the Army of the Potomac at that time. So in Meade's stead, he is now in Tawnytown. In Meade's stead, he is going to send Winfield Scott Hancock, a man who he trusted tremendously, a man who has proven himself time and time again in the Civil War up to this point to command the forces of the field. Howard accepts Meade's order. So Winfield Scott Hancock is going to take command of the Army of the Potomac while Meade makes his way up. So the Army of the Potomac, the 1st and the 11th Corps at this time, they are going to rally around Cemetery Hill. This is a spot that dominates the landscape. You can see for several miles in either direction all around, even more so at the time of the battle. The town reaches up toward this point. The town more than likely would not have reached up this far. The tree cover would have been different. This was an absolute dominating position at the time. And they're going to place several batteries on this hill fortifying it. Meanwhile, Lee also realizes that this is a dominant position. If Lee can hold this position, the Union really has no place to uh, make a stand at. They're going to have to find a different field. They're going to have to retreat. And very likely the Battle of Gettysburg would have ended on July 1st. So Lee is going to give one of the most controversial orders of the Civil War to Richard Stoddard Yule. Take that hill if practicable. So hill is going to determine that it is not practicable. And this is where a bit of controversy at the Battle of Gettysburg comes into. First of all, the word practicable. Most people confuse it with practical. However, you have to remember at the time, Richard Stoddard Yule was new to Corps Command. He was a divisional commander before taking over command of the newly formed 2nd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Robert E. Lee was very, very much used to the likes of giving an order to Stonewall Jackson, who would then deal with the minutia and the details and the tactics of fulfilling that order. So Yule determines that it is not practicable to take this hill. And I can't really blame him in historical hindsight. First of all, the first day of battle at Gettysburg was an incredibly bloody affair. There were about 20,000 men of the Army of the Potomac and about 25,000, 26, some estimates give it 27,000 men of the Army of Northern Virginia. So they had taken a beating. They, have went, they went up against some of the Union's fiercest fighters. They had suffered some pretty heavy casualties. Both sides suffered heavy casualties. The 1st and the 11th Corps would lose nearly half their men as casualties on day one. The 1st and the 11th Corps would really never try truly be the same again after the Battle of Gettysburg. Eventually, in the campaigns of 1864, they would be absorbed into other corps. So the North and the South both are tired. Not only that, but Yule realizes that this position is swarming with artillery. To charge uphill toward artillery would be absolute suicide. It would be nearly impossible to ask his men, who have fought so bravely and given so much up to this point in the battle, to attack this position after a day of hard fighting. So he chooses instead to let his men rest. The 11th Corps, they're going to take positions over on this end of Cemetery Hill. 
near von Steinwehr's brigade. They're going to take positions over here. Von Amsberg's brigade is going to take positions over here. And then elements of the 1st Corps, Wadsworth's division, they're going to take positions there on Culp's Hill, just over this rise behind me. Now, in the evening of July 1st, Yule is going to be reinforced by Allegheny Johnson's division, and he's going to send some men to scout out Culp's Hill. However, the Union had already placed men on Culp's Hill by that time. So rather than fighting at night, which would have been near suicidal, uh, night attacks don't normally go well during the Civil War, during these Napoleonic era tactics, they decide to rest the men and resume the fight the next day. So, the end of July 1st. We have the second corps reinforcing. They're going to take positions to the left, running south towards town, towards seminary or towards cemetery ridge. The 12th corps, which was posted at two taverns at this time, they're going to take positions on Culp's Hill, further reinforcing that area later in the evening. We have the 5th corps on its way from Hanover. We have the 6th corps on its way from Manchester, Maryland. George Gordon Meade is concentrating his forces here at Gettysburg. Now, before the battle, he put out the Pipe Creek Circular, which I mentioned earlier. The Pipe Creek Circular places all of his men on a line from Emmitsburg, Maryland to Manchester, Maryland. They're in northern Frederick and Carroll County. So he's able to take advantage of the roads to concentrate his forces here. Robert E. Lee is able to concentrate his forces as well. His men are spread out on the uh, modern day Route 30 axis, the Chambersburg-York Pike axis at the time. He has men in York, Carlisle. He has men over in Biglerville and men over in Chambersburg and Cashtown. So he too is able to concentrate his forces using the roads to the north while Meade is able to concentrate his forces using the roads to the south. So when you watch the Ken Burns documentary and you hear the narrator say, the Battle of Gettysburg uh, is ironic because the north took the south in and the south took the north roads in, there's some accuracy to that. Well, guys, I appreciate you joining me for this little tour of the first day. Like I said at the beginning, it is my aspiration to become a licensed battlefield guide. And the more I practice, the more I get better at doing this. Not only that, but you guys get to learn some cool things about the Battle of Gettysburg. You get to see that the first day, which is very likely my favorite day of action here at Gettysburg, wasn't just a clash between cavalry and the Confederates like the movie Gettysburg portrays. There was a lot more nuance to it. There was a lot more infantry action. Undoubtedly, the first day could be chalked up as a Confederate victory. The Confederates were able to drive the, the Union from the north and the west of town through the town to the south where they rallied. So look forward to part two in the near future. Hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer. I'm going to cover the second day of battle. Then of course, the third day of battle as well. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me. If you are enjoying my videos, if you are enjoying what I talk about, please remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and maybe leave me a comment letting me know what you think down below. As always, this is Forward Gettysburg, and I'm your host, Aaron Smith, and I will catch you on the next one. The 6th Wisconsin cut. Why can't I say Wisconsin?